All right, thanks so much. Um, so just to start us off, I'm going to start with a question. Um, who would say Australia is an island? Could you just add an emoji, a reaction, whatever, raise your hand or uh, do a thumbs up? Nobody? Am I the only one? I, I would say Australia is an island for one. Okay, so some people think it is, some people think it isn't. Today we're going to be talking about islands just because I decided to use this as an opportunity to share some geographical trivia. Um, and we're going to start off in Australia. So let me just get my screen share on and swap out to this other map. Okay, awesome. So um, we're in Australia and we're going to just work our way towards a fun fact that I learned a few weeks after I started here as data creator at Felt. So we're going to make a map of time zones in Australia. And of course, when you want to make a map, you have to start off with data somehow. You have to find that data somewhere or craft it yourself. You can draw it or you can basically look it up, right? So when I'm making large scale maps like these, global maps or continental maps or several countries or large countries, um, my go-to source is Natural Earth, which I'm sure is a data source that many of you have already used. But Natural Earth is an amazing source because it's just a compilation of geographical data that's really commonly used and it's consistent at scale, it has great attributes, it's pretty lightweight. Um, so if you don't know it, please just check it out. Uh, you can get countries or you can get oceans or grid lines or whatever. Um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna go ahead and click a button to download, whoops, too many buttons, to download time zones. Um, and the first question I get is, do I want elements or do I want a data layer? So I'm gonna talk about a bit the distinction between these two in a while. But for now, let's just go with a data layer, um, which is now uploading. Let's see if I can get the screen, the Zoom stuff out of my way. Now it's just going to be here in the middle. All right. Um, so my time zones are uploading and now processing. Um, in the meantime, I'll say I've always considered Australia to be an island because at least in Spanish, we don't call Australia a continent. We, for us, the continent is Oceania, Oceania, like, you know, all the islands in the Pacific. So um, I thought Australia just was just one more island, but I was impressed to learn that apparently the English speaking word, it's not, it's a continent in itself. Right, our data is processed. Um, we now have a time zones layer and you'll see it probably at a glance that Australia seems to have three time zones, right? We have one here on the east, which is UTC plus 10. Uh, we have one in the middle, UTC plus nine and a half. So it's a half hour delay between these two. And then one on the West, Western Australia, UTC plus eight. So there's a one and a half hour difference. But one thing I noticed when I was creating this layer originally for our data library is that there's one down here in the bottom. And so this is Australia's fourth time zone. And as you can see, it's pretty small and it's UTC plus 845. This is called Euclid time zone. And when you get there, you'll see a sign that says, advance your clocks 45 minutes because you're entering the central Western time zone. So let me just make that a bit bigger. And let's start making a map around this piece of trivia. For starters, let's just take a look to see how large it is. It is, let's add our measurements, 153 kilometers. I'm not sure what that is in miles, I'm guessing like around 90 or between 90 and 100. Um, so it's a pretty small place for the size of Australia. Um, and if I were to style this layer, I'd first of all start by that's just changing the name, right? And just calling this time zones. And then ideally what I'd want, a typical time zone map will have a color for each time zone. So let's go ahead and just make a color by category map. And instead of using the default uh, field that is given to me object ID, I'm gonna select the time zone field, okay? And I'm gonna label by, I'm not going to label it all. Okay, so this is almost good, but as you can see, the central and eastern and Euclid time zones have the same name, have the same color, sorry, and that's because my categorical color by category style by default picks the top 10 um, most frequent values inside the layer, which is the whole world right now, but what I, I only want Australia, so I'm going to go into the advanced style editor, um, and here I can use the felt style language FSL to further fine tune my map, right? And I'm just going to say that instead of all these categories, I want only four categories and they're going to be UTC plus 10. I already have that one plus 930. 
plus 8 and plus 8, 45. OK, and I don't want to show other values, so that's going to be false. And I'm going to limit my colors to the top four that were picked for me. Um, and that is basically it. My map is ready. OK, so just to make the Euclid part stand up, you know, like pop up, pop off the map a bit more, I'm going to go ahead and use the clip tool the scissors tool inside the pop-up, which is similar to the one you've already used, to turn this from a data layer to an element. We can start seeing the differences. Elements are more visually prominent. They live on top of data, and I can do other kinds of operations with them. For example, I can move them around. I don't want to move them around. I don't want anybody else to move them around, so I'm just going to lock this element in place. Okay, and I'm going to use some other elements, because images are also elements, to just annotate this map a bit more. Maybe add some text here that says, you know, around 300 people live here in this tiny strip of land that's locked between two time zones. OK, so that's been an example of a successful data upload. But what happens when things go wrong? Well, to do that, we're going to go to another non-island, uh, which is the place where all bad geographical data is born. And of course, if you're familiar with the term, I'm talking about null island, which has the coordinates 0, 0. And I have to remember which is latitude, longitude. OK, we are at null island. Um, null island is a bit of a tongue in cheek term to refer to this place, uh, these coordinates off the, western, the coast of West Africa um, that just happens to have the coordinate 0, 0. And it's mainly, it's used many times as the null value for data. So for example, in this, quite popular flight tracker app, you'll see that for some reason there's like between, I don't know, like tens and hundreds of planes that are just levitating over this spot. It's probably because they don't have coordinates and they've defaulted to zero, zero. It's a pretty common problem. Let's spice this up and just like give it a better emoji and a better name, Null Island. Okay, perfect. Um, and just as a fun fact, uh, there's a 1957 cartoon called Colonel Bleep that takes place in Zero Zero Island. So even though the term Null Island is relatively modern, and we have someone who helped popularize the term in this call, by the way, um, but it's actually been used for quite a number of years right now, um, at least the concept of Zero Zero Island. So are we actually there? Let's zoom out and see. Okay, it seems we are. And we also have a list of file formats that you can upload to felt right here. So I'm going to start differentiating between geospatially native file formats, if that makes sense, and tabular data file formats. Because all these formats that I'm listing here, shapefiles, GeoJSON, GeoPackage, KML, GPX, et cetera, all of these are formats that were custom built, purposely made to hold geospatial data in them, to hold coordinates and have stuff like coordinate reference systems, et cetera. Um, but sometimes, um, our data is not in that format. It's in the tabular format, which we'll talk about later. So basically, you should expect anything in this very long list to just work inside Felt. Um, if it doesn't, then please just you know contact support, shout out, and we'll take a look at it. Um, and I wanted to highlight one of these. This should be somewhere else. Oh, no. Oh, I had a little surprise here, but forgot to put it in place. <laughs> so. Um, so what about shapefiles? There's a very common problem that we see when we're doing data support with shapefiles, which is that sometimes, you know, someone sends me a zip shapefile like this one of the time zones and I click on it and I open and it opens on my computer. And then my, my Mac is automatically unzipping this file. And so I, I see a bunch of files inside it and I'm like, well, I wonder which is the shapefile. So this one's called .shp. That sounds like a shapefile. Um, here it says Esri shape documents. I'm just going to drag that in. And if you've ever done this in any other software, you probably will just get an error. Fortunately, Felt tries to at least guide you in the right direction by explaining that a shapefile is made of several files and they have to be packed together. OK, that's great. Um, and by the way, this problem is so common. Here's the surprise that was unveiled by accident that there is a very common GIF uh, or GIF. No, sorry, a very common meme um, in the geospatial world about shapefiles, right? Because it's very common, send me the shapefile, I only send the OSHP, and then it just won't work anywhere else. So what about tabular data? Well, to explore tabular data, um, I thought it'd be fun to 
place a little discussion in the most tabular, most rectangular place on Earth. So I Googled what is the most rectangular country, and apparently there's an answer for that. There's a website called, or a place that someone's explored the question, the rectangularness of countries. And the answer is Egypt. I'm not fully convinced, but why not? Uh, so let me just move that polygon out of the way. And since we're talking about islands, I'm going to go all the way into Gizida Island in Cairo. So we can talk about tabular data. So what is tabular data? Well, tabular data is data that is structured as rows and columns, for example, a spreadsheet. And it's normally distributed as either an Excel file, .xls, .xlsx, or a text file, a plain text file that has this distinction by a common separator. These are normally called CSVs or TSVs or even TXTs. Um, we see a lot more issues when people are uploading these kinds of data into Feld because we have a series of expectations around them. So the first one is that coordinates have to be in latitude longitude. There, of course, exist other coordinate reference systems, but if you upload a CSV with, say, cor coordinates in meters of Weber Cater or in meters in UTM or in Lambert, conical conformal, whatever, we're not going to be able to parse that because we're missing some information about how to bring that data into Feld. So we need coordinates to be in latitude longitude, and we need them to be either a pair of numeric fields, say x, y, or lat long, latitude, longitude, but it has to be a pair of fields. If this is all in one field, it won't work. Or a single field with the geometry in a format that is commonly used to express geometries as text. For example, WKT, well-known text, or hex-encoded well-known binary, if you're familiar with it, or GeoJSON. Um, here at the bottom is an example of a polygon expressed as well-known text. So that's one very common issue. Uh, another one is having, having empty header rows. For some reason, some people like to start their spreadsheets. They don't like to start on the first row, so they start on some later row, and then that won't work. So for example, these three fields at the top, these empty header rows that don't contain the actual table of data, um, I'll have to remove those before I can bring this data into Feld. But by and large, the most typical problem is not actually an error. It's just that sometimes people bring in data into Feld expecting um, things to work because there is actually some geospatial information in them. So take, for example, this TXT that I've just dropped in a note. Um, it, has many rows um, and it has two columns, right? One is a city name and the other is a URL. So some people drop this into felt thinking, okay, well, my cities are gonna turn, get turned into cities on the map or my countries or my zip codes or my whatever. Um, and we don't do this right now because this requires actually an additional step called geocoding, which is turning um, names of places into coordinates. So fortunately, uh, this is not supported by Felt right now, but fortunately you can use some other software. I just found, just basically Google free online geocoder and found this one that works pretty nice. So I'm gonna upload here that same CSV that I already have on my computer. Just gonna drag it in here. It's, where do I have it? This mysterious file.csv. <laughs> um, and it's telling me, oh, hey, you've uploaded seven lines, two columns. And I'm going to give it some info to help the geocoder. So I want to geocode based on the city name. That's what's going to turn into places. And I'm going to use the city name as a city so that I can give some more information about what I'm expecting to find. And I'll just press geocode. My addresses are being geocoded. And now I can download the results, go back into Felt, and drag this in as a data layer. OK, and what is inside this mysterious file? Well, if you've read the URLs, you might have already figured it out. It's processing right now in my top right corner, but should be pretty quick. Let's see if it is. Yeah, it's going pretty fast. OK, what we have here are points, points around the world. And what do those points contain? Oh, something is glitching out here. Let me just refresh my tab. Um, what do these points contain? Well, they contain another data source that I like to use a lot, which is when I'm making a local map on a city, um, I like to first just go onto the city's open data portal if they have one. So for example, here is Toronto, and I can go on to, I could just Google Toronto open data, or here I have the link, and find myself in a portal where I can find some interesting data sets. And my main tip, if you find yourself here, is that out of these 433, 
many of them are not going to work on your map. They might not have a geospatial component. This first one does seem to have one because you can get it as a GeoJSON, but sometimes they don't. So normally you have, see, for example, here. So normally you have some kind of format selector and you can just filter, for example, by shapefile, which is the most common, or GeoJSON or GeoPackage. Um, and here everything should directly work into felt. And I can bring in, for example, street furniture or COVID-19 testing sites or whatever I'm interested in making my map. Um, and I'm just going to finish showing one last data source, which for me is the best data source, the final data source, the data source to rule them all, which is, of course, OpenStreetMap. So let's go to another actual island that I'm obsessed about lately, which is called the uh, the René Levasseur, René Levasseur Island, I suppose that's how it's pronounced. It's in the northeast of Canada. And I was drawn to it because, as you can see, it's an island inside of a lake. And both of them, both of them are actually almost perfectly circular. This is actually created by the sixth largest known impact on Earth. It's an impact crater and was then turned later on into an artificial island by a reservoir. It's beautiful. And we're going to try and extract that to make our map. So most base maps that you see around um, are actually using OpenStreetMap. And if you're not familiar with OpenStreetMap, OpenStreetMap, also called OSM, um, is a huge crowdsourced worldwide database, uh, kind of like Wikipedia, but for maps. Um, and it's what powers our base map, most base maps. It powers a lot of layers on our side, our data catalog. For example, our bicycle lanes are from OSM, our railway layers from OSM, a lot more are too. I'm going to try and extract data from OSM to get my island. The bad thing about working with OSM is that um, the amount of data is normally huge, and it has a specific st a structure. It's called a tagging system, where every element, every object from OSM on a map has a certain set of tags, right? And you have to know these tags to know what you're doing. And these tags are sometimes just made up by consensus uh, by the people who are editing the, editing the map. So. The easiest way to work with OSM, in my opinion, is using a tool called Overpass Turbo. Overpass Turbo is um, just a little web app, basically, that lets you go anywhere on Earth. I'm already at the spot where I want. And you can write an Overpass query here on the left called, using what's called Overpass Query Language. Now, it sounds a bit complicated because there's code and everything. But the good thing is that you can use the wizard and it mostly works OK. So for example, I am in my island, uh, and it's going to query the viewport by default, so what I'm looking at. And I want the island. So I'm just going to go ahead and type in island and build and run my query. And there is my data. And if you look down here in the bottom right, you'll see there is a large number of nodes and ways and relations, which is how OSM internally treats um, geometries, but it's displayed as something we're more familiar with, which is points and lines and polygons. In this case, 11 polygons. So there's, there's 11 islands here. There's not only the one. There's even islands inside lakes, inside the island, inside a lake, which is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and download that. And I'm just going to do the same. Well, I'm going to upload it into felt, drag it in. And in the meantime, I'm going to do the same for the water. OK, we're running our query. About three megabytes, yeah, that's acceptable. And I'm going to export it, download it, and bring it in as well. OK, so my layers have now processed at least one of them. And I'm going to style it. And I'm just going to give it a better title. I have the name here. OK, and I'm also going to style it in kind of charred black color, as if you know the crater had just, the, the meteor had just impacted on Earth. Um, I'm going to take off the labels. Oops, I'm going to take off the labels. All right, perfect. Um, and then I'm going to do the same for the water. Just going to go ahead, get the right name. OK, let's give this a no labels and a fiery red color. OK. And now you can imagine that this was, you know, the impact of the meteor generating this crater full of, I don't know, fiery lava. I'm sure this, or magma, I'm sure this isn't how geology actually works, but I like to imagine it is just like rivers of fire. Um, when I was looking at this, I was told that it looked like the Eye of Sauron. Here's another surprise. So if that is the case, I suppose this is actually 
the one data source to rule them all. Um, and that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening to me. And if there are any questions, I think I'll be taking them in the final session with Rachel. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Alvaro. This was really impressive. Um, I hope it answered a lot of questions about um, common challenges people have uploading it into felt. So uh, really impressive. Thank you. And um, now I really want to uh, go into our customer panel uh, where we're going to look at different maps uh, folks created and um, learn their tips and tricks. Um, and I want to start our customer panel uh, with uh, William Petty, who um, worked on a survey of cycling conditions around Hackney, uh, a London neighborhood where uh, he resides. So uh, William, please take it away. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, hopefully you're all looking at a map now of uh, Hackney, as Anna said, which is where I live in northeast London. Um, I'm involved in uh, cycle campaigning there, so that's, that's what this, this map is going to be about and this presentation is going to be about. Um, so a little bit of background, um, Hackney's got really high levels of cycling. I think it's the highest anywhere in London um, and it's almost the highest in the United Kingdom um, for various sort of historical reasons. Uh, we have a really sort of um, so, uh, sympathetic uh, local administration who wants to help us with that kind of stuff. Um, and we have a thriving sort of uh, community of campaigners here. Um, balanced against that, we don't have an awful lot of uh, sort of built infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, quite a lot of people kind of get by by uh, strength in numbers and, and, you know, sort of kind of finding their own way around stuff. Um, and also the, the council is frequently very short of money to, to build this kind of stuff. So that's that's a little bit of the kind of background, like compared to other places in the UK and certainly North American cities I've been to, this is a great place to cycle. But um, if you're used to other places in Northern Europe, you will not be particularly impressed. I just want to manage expectations if you, if you come and see us. So everything changed uh, during the COVID pandemic because... Um, Transport for London, which is the, the kind of citywide transit authority, suddenly made a lot of funding available very quickly to boroughs who wanted to put in kind of livable streets schemes. Um, and Hackney and various other boroughs took this money and they used it to put in low traffic neighbourhoods, which is a type of intervention, not just for cycling, but for all you know, for pedestrians as well, where you basically take an area that's bounded by main roads and you make it impossible to drive across it uh, using barriers in the road. So you can drive in and out, but basically all the through traffic is uh, is cut out. And like this is quite kind of politically difficult, as you would imagine, if you've ever had any experience of trying to stop people driving where they want to drive. But Hackney basically weathered the storm and these schemes are all permanent. And the effect on cycling was like absolutely transformative. Like in the space of, I'm going to say a few months, we basically got like a decade's worth of improvements and about 30% of the borough like went almost overnight from being not particularly pleasant to cycle in to being really, really safe. Like, you know, you can cycle on the street with young kids, which is what we're campaigning for. One limitation of this approach is that these areas are great to cycle within, but if you want to cycle from one to another, you come across the problem of the main road that basically defines it. So you, you don't necessarily get long distance routes from this. So as a cycle campaign, we decided we wanted to capitalize on, on this stuff that had been done, basically make some suggestions for things that could also be done quite cheaply and quickly to basically link up these, these new low traffic neighborhoods. Um, so we decided to make a map that would identify locations where you could put a crossing in for, you know, like not, not a huge amount of money and suddenly unlock a whole load of new cycling stuff. Uh, I wanted to do this with other campaigners and somebody suggested to me that felt was the way to do it. So I thought I would give it a try. Um, I made this kind of base map using a, a mask of Hackney, which is the gray shape you can see and uh, the, the main rows in brown. Sent this off to about 10 other people and asked them to start dropping pins on the map, um, which they did like, incredibly quickly. Like people took to this really, really well. It was very... I know some of them are on the call, guys. Brilliant, well done. Um, this is really pleasing. Like within about a week or so, we've managed to gather all this all this data that you can see here. And sometimes people put notes on it. Um, like sometimes people put pictures on. I don't know if you can see that there. Um, so yeah, like really, really quickly, we managed to gather like loads of useful information. Um, the next stage in the workflow was to download this point layer um, from Felt. If you haven't done that before uh, there is uh, export as geojson oops disappeared um, and i then brought that into qgis which is an open source bit of software for manipulating geospatial data um, it's very powerful it's not hugely user friendly but what i wanted to do was um, turn these points into little into lines basically so i wanted to extract from a layer of the existing road network that i got from openstreetmap to make 
uh, lines showing you not just where, the, where these crossings were, but where they would go to and where they would go from, because I thought that was going to be much more useful. Uh, and the other thing we, I wanted to do in QGIS was basically use it to manipulate the data so that when I uploaded it again to felt it was going to be in the right, uh, you know, the structure of the data was going to give me the, the options to display it in the way I wanted to. So I'm just going to go to the finish map now. And you can see that these points have become lines, um, pink ones for ones that we're proposing and green ones for ones that are already in existence. Um, and I think these lines are much more powerful in, in telling the story we want to tell, which is that you know you can join up these gateways to make routes basically cover the whole of, of the borough. So there are a few other things that I've um, I wanted to add to this map as well. Um, those low traffic neighbourhoods that I was telling you about, so that's a layer on there as well. I'm just going to turn that on. So these are the ones that were put in during COVID. You can see it's like a huge area. And you can see, I hope, the way that these gateways will link up those areas to make uh, make that a, a much safer place to, for people to cycle long distances across the borough. Um, another one of our aims was about enabling um, kids to cycle to school. So I was pleased with this. This is one of the things in the styling options. If you zoom in, didn't want them to become available straight away. But if you zoom in, you can see the schools. And if you zoom in further, the names pop up on them as well, or they should do. There we go. Um, yes, yeah, so that's it. I see I'm almost out of time. Now, this is basically our finished map. Next stage is we're going to embed this on our website so we can share it with members of the public. Um, we also want to get it into the hands of like, the local authorities who are actually doing this stuff so that hopefully next time they redesign a road, they can reference this map and go, ah, we could just put in a safe cycle crossing. We're doing the work anyway. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I've got to tell you. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Willem. That was really uh, impressive. I'm sure a lot of people um, who are um, building communities around biking in their cities um, can take note and um, apply it in their in their neighborhood. Uh, well, and uh, next up we have Angelica, um, our winner of a Halloween mapping challenge, uh, who is also um, creating a lot of impressive maps for for a November 30, uh, like a, a mapping challenge in November as well. So she's going to uh, show us uh, her map of um, of biggest pumpkins in the world. Uh, hi, all. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Great. So I'm, I'm Angie. I go by Angie and I live in Sacramento. I'm a hydrogeologist and I think about every day like um, with water and groundwater management, how how can you um, show that to people and have people label their wells and where their wells are dry? And like, how do you make that data interaction more transparent with people? And for that reason, I thought that felt or interactive mapping in general would be a really cool thing to try out. And so I wanted to start with something fun. So I made this pumpkin map for the challenge. And um, so the first thing um, I wanted to know is uh, where are the giant pumpkins? And there's a list of world record winners with uh, countries and provinces, but no specific locations. So that was my first challenge was to try and get some points on a map. And so I read articles about all these pumpkins to try and find out where, what city they were grown in more specifically, if I could find um, like what region, uh, what farm they were grown on. So that was really cool. And I was able to uh, find a lot of information online about that. And I linked to all the articles in each of the points. Uh, another thing that I did after that is I learned a lot about pumpkin growing history, which is just really wacky and fun. So I was able to include some anecdotes. Um, for example, there are some brothers uh, that participated and they would constantly um, one up each other. Sometimes one brother would win, sometimes another would win. And so that was really cool. There is a couple that is a giant pumpkin grower and they have both won. So that was really cool. There's a daughter dad duo that have also participated and so just fun stuff like that I wanted to add onto this map so, and it kind of treated it as just a giant storyboard and so I compiled everything in excel and then I uploaded everything so that's how I got the points and yeah so along the way I learned some really cool things like pumpkin genetics um, so actually if you zoom into these uh, you can see that seeds from previous giant pumpkins are used in um, more recent winters. So here you can see that for the 28th giant pumpkin, uh, 
number 24 and 27 giant pumpkin seeds were used in the growth of that pumpkin, which is really cool. And so um, now I wanna know, um, is this statistically significant? Um, for example, are these pumpkins giant because they've been bred to be giant or um, are they just a result of growing conditions? So that's something to look into in the future. And then also on this map, I wanted to incorporate this data in as many different forms as possible. So you have the spatial visualization, but also you have it um, as a list and then also as a chart. Let's see, did I miss anything? Oh, and finally, for the final effect of like kind of general spookiness, I wanted to import um, these transparent PNGs. I got these from the internet, but these clouds I actually made in Illustrator. And that's another cool thing that was um, fun to figure out is you can make anything on Illustrator and export it as a transparent PNG, and then you can import it into Felt. So that is really cool. It really um, enables you to customize your map. And then finally, I turned off um, all the uh, background maps and I just had the satellite. And then I imported um, world administrative boundaries and changed the color. So that was the final, the final effect to get the spookiness. And then um, to really just identify the world record pumpkin zone, I drew this rectangle around uh, where they were grown. And that, I don't know, to me, it looks like there's a pretty specific record or like area of pumpkin growth. So another thing, like, is that statistically significant or is it not? So that's another thing to explore. Um, but overall, I really enjoyed using Felt as a giant storyboard. And um, yeah, I wonder if I can uh, further dive into this. And for that, that's it for me. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Angie. This is, um, this is really impressive. Me and uh, Rachel also uh, started looking into the stories of all this uh, giant pumpkin growth and it's a fascinating world and a very competitive world. Um, well, uh, next up we have uh, Chris, who is a USA Today developer and uh, he's gonna show us um, how he uses Felt for um, telling stories uh, and um, reporting on current events. Chris. Oh, and can you please stop sharing the screen? Thank you. All right, here we go. So um, as mentioned, uh, I'm Chris. I work at USA Today and USA Today Network, which is all the, um, the Gannett newspapers uh, around the US. It's about 200 newspapers we work with. Um, so I'm on a team called the Storytelling Studio, and we build storytelling tools. Um, and I'll show you a couple of stories that we've um, helped produce. Uh, but we build, um, what I like to say is we don't fight fires, we build fire engines. So we tend to build things that are get reused again and again, and we try to build things um, in ways that are can work for lots of different newsrooms around our network. So this is a map that I actually made this week um, or last week from uh, an older project that we did last year uh, before Felt uh, was public, at least, um, or before I knew about it. And this is a map of nursing homes around the country and how they performed during the um, the winter peak of uh, the Omicron peak of COVID-19. I'm just gonna hide the controls here so I can see it. Um, this is a data set that came out of an investigation um, that my colleagues did, uh, and particularly uh, Jamie Frazier, uh, who's the, the main reporter on this and who wrangled a lot of this data um, and dealt with CMS and um, cleaned it up and came up with this rating system um, based on how many infections or deaths or um, there's actually grades for every uh, individual sort of facet that you can measure. Um, and it's a really fascinating data set. And in the course of this, uh, a couple of the reporters who were working on this had um, members of their family that were in nursing homes that they needed to use this data to check, like, is this a safe place to put someone I care about? Um, so I, I make a lot of maps. I don't publish a lot of maps. A lot of my conversation with people about maps is actually about is this thing that you have, is this data set that you have um, best presented as a map? Should it be a map? Should it not be a map? Um, and this is one of those that we spent a long time debating, um, should it be a map? Should it be a table? Should it be a database? Um, and 
one of the fastest ways to answer that question is to just make a map real quick and say, does this, can you tell a story out of this? Does this um, actually tell the story we want to tell? And looking at this, I would actually say, no, this is not, this is probably not, the map is not the interesting thing about this or the important thing about this, except in the degree of you need to know where um, a particular place is. Uh, and so when I look at this, what I see is that there's just a whole distribution of places that are good and bad. Um, I made purple good and orange bad. Um, but I was able to make this in about 20 minutes, most of which was just flutzing in with colors. Um, so that was cool. Um, I did not have this tool available at the time, um, but I have my own stack that I've mostly been using um, to quickly sketch out maps. Um, but this is one of the things that has come up a lot in talking to reporters is if you have a data set that is geographic, can you just very quickly see what does it look like? Um, it, could we map this? Could we, um, if we do map it, what story does it tell? Um, and so for us, what we realize is that the important thing um, with this data set is seeing um, what pla how places are rated and then where are they in relation to each other? Where are they in relation to you? Because um, you are the sort of data point that is not on here. Um, so I'll show you what we ended up making um, was this, this lookup, um, which I'll, I'll, there's a link to it in this map and I'll put it in the chat. Um, but this, is, this will allow you to sort through um, all of the nursing homes that we've rated, see all of the ratings that um, we gave them, um, you can search your location or search by a name. You can filter by grade. There's a lot of stuff in here. It's it's a really fantastic data set. And if you want to play with it, there's a link right here to download the data. That's what I did. I I took the publicly available data and I put it into here. Um, this is the actual story, um, which is also linked in here. Um, but that's that's one of the things that I think has been really useful to me is actually using... Uh, ironically felt as a way to decide what maps not to make. Um, to say, looking at this, showing a, a nationwide map of where all nursing homes are doesn't really tell the story we want to tell. What we need to do is get you to here um, and say, if I'm here, these are the places that I am comfortable sending someone to. Maybe not this, maybe not these ones or these ones or something else. And there's there's actually several um, metrics that we can measure by. So that's the other thing. Um, so yeah, this is, um, I'm just in the beginning of exploring this. Um, we have another project coming out that is actually what got me started this workflow uh, and it should be launching tomorrow. Um, I wish it were out today so I could show you, but I'll, I'll make sure to post a link to it. Um, but I did post a few links to a couple other things. The other thing that I'm always interested in doing, um, and I just want to show this real quick, is things that um, direct your attention around the map. So I know um, people have uh, asked about this in Slack, but doing things like this is eventually what we always end up doing is programmatically changing things. Um, and so I have a tool called Ulysses that, that I use for that. Um, but anyway, those are all linked in here. I'm trying to think what else I was going to tell you about it. Anyway, this, is, this has been really fun to just play with and use as sort of a sketch pad. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Chris. I think um, it's a really interesting um, approach for for reporters to understand, um, you know, which data is really worth uh, visualizing. I think it's a, it's really brilliant. Well, and um, our um, our next speaker is Megan, who is um, working with census data and um, mapping different cities. So, um, Megan, please um, tell us about your map. Hi, I'm Megan. I live in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I come from a little bit of a different background. Um, 
in art and technology. I've been calling myself a creative technologist these days just because I like to dabble in all sorts of things. And I currently work kind of in a fabrication and uh, creative technology lab in an art college at uh, the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Um, but I've always been interested in telling stories with data or trying to learn that. Um, I've mostly got my start in uh, music visualization, like doing live video for musicians for shows. And it's sort of like, oh, okay, we're all using data in different ways, like how you express feelings and information. Um, but uh, I wanted to get into uh, web development. And so I started volunteering with a local group called Hack Oregon, um, trying to use uh, open and public data and understand the city and communicate information. And so in my process, I was learning how to use um, Leaflet and QGIS and making web maps. Um, and then when I saw that felt could uh, take all sorts of data in, I got excited and I was like, oh, I'm gonna recreate what I did in uh, Leaflet, but in felt. Um, so these uh, coordinates are just the neighborhoods of Portland um, and the dots are actually uh, public demolition permits that were issued over time. Um, I sort of decided to start exploring what public data was available and what this meant in comparison to city and demographics. And uh, so the, there's lots of points, of course, but if you start clicking on the neighborhoods in QGIS, I sort of mapped things out, um, knowing a little bit about neighborhood demographics just casually. I was like, wow, this Lentz area, which is a little bit poorer neighborhood uh, has 190 demol uh, demolition permits. And then the most was this Brentwood Darlington neighborhood with 221. And uh, while I'm not, you know, it's a little obvious that like, okay, well, maybe they're tearing these uh, houses in poor neighborhoods down for gentrification. Um, Portland has a history of redlining, things like that. Um, so then, I sort of added the uh, census block groups. If I turn those on, you can sort of click and see um, the demographics of the area because during our time at Hack Oregon, we sort of like found that whatever services and data that were available, if you sort of put them in relation to neighborhood and the demographics of those neighborhoods, hopefully you could find um, different issues or stories that come about. Um, and as I was looking through this, this is mostly just practice as I get better. So I was like super excited how easy felt was because as I was learning how to do this and leaflet and QGIS, you know, it was quite a bit harder. Um, and when I was poking around, just sort of revisiting this map, I saw this uh, person's below poverty line map. And it sort of also fits within the uh, demolition map areas. Like these are all just correlations. So I can't say story to story, like what causes what, but it's just an interesting way to start exploring and learning about the city. Um, working in an art college, it seems like I wouldn't use something like this, but I'm actually excited to use felt as a way to uh, work with our collaborative design and uh, systems design graduate students, maybe. Um, they're interested in data visualization and research, and so we can use this so that I don't have to uh, make them learn how to do coding from scratch, and we can do exploratory um, information analysis this way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and now we have around 12 minutes for a Q&A session. Uh, Rachel, um, would you like to um, take a look at our questions? Yes, I would. And we've got some good ones. So I'm just going to pull them up here. Um, and don't forget, there's still time if you've got questions. Um, so the first one, and I'll stop sharing my screen, um, is for you, Alvaro. Um, which is about our new GeoJSON API. 
Um, can you, and this is from Chris uh, Amico. So is it, wait, who, no, who asked this question? <laughs> it's not me. I, it's not you, but it's Chris, other Chris. It's always another Chris. Um, yeah, Chris Soriano. Soriano, sorry. <laughs> um, so you want to ask your question, Chris, so that Alvaro can give you a good response. Sure. Um, so I, I saw the new <clears throat> the new ability where you you append GeoJSON to a to a public map, and then you can share it or you can use it in other applications and things. And I was just wondering, does that mean like the underlying data? Let's say you brought in a bunch of points and you have them on a map. Can you can you use that in another application, or is it just the images? Like if you're you know the coordinates of those images, can you also use those images in another application or how does it all work it's probably it's probably too big a question for this you know 12 minutes yeah well what i can share is that um it works like our geojson export which is that any elements you have on the map can then be used in another application so a good example might be like will's group who are working and creating a bunch of elements with information they can then um, export that programmatically now. Um, and so if you're creating data in felt using the elements feature, then that can easily be moved into other applications now by simply appending with the GeoJSON. 